<laughs> hey everybody, I'm the Bat Otter, and I'm back with another review. I've wanted, uh, so obviously, if you can't tell, I checked this out from the library. Uh, really helpful, you guys should go to the library. Uh, I'm already on volume 5 of Berserk, this is obviously volume 2. Uh, and I'm loving the series, of course. I mean, you guys saw the last review, I love the series a lot. Uh, so, let's get right into it. No sense in burying the lead. So, uh, we left off in volume 1 at, uh, the beginning of the Golden Age arc. Uh, poor Guts is getting manhandled by a man. And this book opens to just an excellent cover, uh, of a younger Guts. Which the early Golden Age arc, and I suppose the entire Golden Age arc, takes you through Guts' like teenage years development, uh, and basically gives you a lot of the backstory. Why doesn't he like it whenever people touch him? This, that, all these sorts of things, and we get right into that. So, we pick up where we left off. Uh, Guts is being, of course, manhandled. He's traumatized. I mean, he's a kid, right? And I don't know what part it is, but the guy basically tells him, hey, it's Gambino that sold you out. I did that because he wanted me to. And Guts, as a kid, and having Gambino as a father figure, he refuses to believe that. Because why would he? He's a kid. I mean, my, you know, oh, he would never do that to me, right? Uh, and so we go into various battles that he has with the mercenary group until after one battle, uh, Guts ends up killing the man who assaulted him, right? Uh, which really shows the beginning of Guts' rage and his revenge and things like that. Uh, he kills him in a forest and stabs him in the mouth. As a kid, he's like, what, 13 here? So it shows you how messed up, uh, Guts' childhood was, his developmental years, and the most important years of his life. Uh, and then, of course, he sees his father figure get, uh, injured. He loses the leg. And uh, they managed to save him, but he's never really the same afterwards. Uh, I mean, Gambino is always a jerk, but now he's even worse. He's treating a dog better than he treats his own kid. Uh, he's still beating his kid. All the mercenaries are watching it happen, but they don't care, right? They really don't care about the well-being. So eventually, Gambino is drunk, sneaks into Gut's tent at night, and, uh, starts attacking him. And just defending himself, Guts kills him. He stabs him right through the neck, as any kid would be traumatized by something like that. And in doing so, he changes his life for the worst. And all the while, uh, uh you know, I'm going over these things really fast. Um, but the way that it's illustrated is, look at the way that Miura decides to shadow the entire of, uh, entirety of Gambino's face after Gambino reveals that, yes, he did indeed sell out Guts to be assaulted by that guy. And that just breaks Guts' heart. I mean, look at him. The poor kid. His father sold him out. He just got told he's about to get killed. And, well, he has to defend himself. And it's just one bad thing after another from that point on where he kills Gambino... Gambino falls on top of him in this very dramatic, terrible, terrible, terrible scene. His blood spilling on Guts. Of course, he's blaming Guts for the death of Sis, uh, the mother figure, because Guts was an omen, a curse. And Guts is in complete regret and sorrow because he just killed his father figure. The people find him. They immediately start chasing after him in the rain until Guts falls off a cliff. And we get one of the first pages of this nice skyline of Guts being half-dead, looking at a vast landscape, until he gets attacked by wolves. I mean, the guy can't catch a break. And you get this very beautiful, slow scene of him at night, in the middle of nowhere, just some kid lost. Uh, and it, it, everything about this is, is so wonderfully, wonderfully? Beautifully illustrated, because every ounce of emotion that Miura wants to get out of you, he does. And so just on instinct, as he's getting attacked by wolves, he dispatches of the wolves a little bit too easily and uses the rage and the sadness and the hate, as he does in his later years, to kill the wolves and scare them off and defend himself until he collapses and he's found by... Uh, who was he found by? 
He's found by some people. Uh, so he joins another mercenary band. Some years pass. And uh, I'm talking over this page. Uh, so one thing that you'll notice in Berserk is if I can get even a full view of this page, you'll notice, uh, especially in the Golden Age arcs, it, it drops off after it's less medieval fantasy and more, you know, dark fantasy. But you'll notice that Miro makes a very honest effort and a complete effort to illustrate the entire battlefield, or at least give establishing shots uh, and have almost as much detail and action as possible to establish the setting of the battlefield. And you think, well, these are real cool shots, you know, everybody turns the pages real fast. But as the story goes on and progresses, you'll start to notice the actual importance of these shots. Here, it's just to establish the raid of a castle that this mercenary group is going after. As you can see, they're climbing up the ladder, scaling the walls, they're fighting up top, and it's a pretty even battle. There's some dead people there, a commander leading the army, and there's smoke rising all over the place. And that is where Miura excels at, because obviously every single page can't be illustrated like this. That's too taxing, especially for a manga. So it's it's a little trick I've noticed after reading five of these volumes, and uh, you know I don't say trick in a negative connotation. Uh, every artist needs tricks and little uh, gimmicks and and pulling rabbits out of hats in order to get the artwork done. And it's not a sign of a cheap artist; it's a sign of a very experienced and uh, mature artist. Because with that huge splash page that probably took a really long time. He no longer needs to illustrate as much as the background. He can focus much more on the characters and interaction between the characters now that he's already shown you where they are. You have that already in your head. So now it's a few characters. He adds the tiny, tiny little details of the background. He has a couple more uh, background shots here and there scattered throughout the page. But look at this one. No background whatsoever. No background here. Just screen tones here, tones here, tones here. Same all over the place. But with the rhythmic reminder of the setting whenever they're not fighting, because you don't need to do the background while they're fighting, you need the motion. You focus on one part. Uh, in doing so, in your mind, it's almost like the background is always there, even though it's only there sometimes. Because when you're reading it, you see it it's already in your head because he's so well established it previously and has little tiny reminders of where you are intermittently throughout the battles, throughout the scenes, whatever they may be, that it's just unnecessary to continue to do that. That would be the definition of over-rendering. And sure, would it be cool if that was there everywhere? Yeah, but he's a human being, right? Uh, and so, of course, at the start of every... Uh, at the start and end, he reminds you, he re-establishes the shot, gives a nice splash page, as any good illustrator should. Uh, and then at the beginning, he has the uh, different format illustration of the of the book, and re-establishes the shot, because it's a brand new page. Uh, this one, we get foreshadowing of Griffith. Uh, I'm only going to be going as far as the first volume in this volume, as I usually do. Uh, Guts is offered a mercenary to be a... Uh, you know, hired as a mercenary for them, but he turns it down. He's going exploring. I think he's maybe 15 here. And the band of the Hawks find him. They challenge him. And uh, he dispatches of them pretty easily. Now, this is where we get introduced to many new characters. And the introductions of the characters, or the reintroductions of characters like Griffith, is very important. Griffith, very calm, very relaxed. Uh, lying down as him and Casca watch the band just try to take on this kid until they realize, hey, this kid's a problem. So Griffith sends in Casca. Casca is not able to take out Guts, but is able to trade blows with him. Uh, Guts sees that she's a girl. He hesitates. And it's not until Griffith gets involved that Guts finally meets an adversary. And this shot of Griffith, the young Griffith, Every single question you had in the first volume is answered in this one. It's like a, the relationship between Guts and Griffith. How did they meet? Where did they come from? What's with Guts' backstory? How was he born? I mean, it gives you birth 
all the way until uh, he's back at the castle with the slug count, it gives you all of that. And it gives it to you in ways that make sense for the story and have the maximum impact on the overarching story. And if you read the entirety of the Golden Age up to the Eclipse, and you go back and read the first volume, so many more things make sense. All of a sudden you're like, that's why he did that, that's why he did that, that's why he did that. There's origins to all the uh, previous things, and that's one of the greatest parts about the story, is that every single little thing has a purpose. It Nothing is placed without it being intentional. Uh, as I say that, I can't cite many examples here exactly, but as I continue, I'll be sure to point out some very interesting tidbits. So here, of course, uh, Guts challenges Griffith despite the fact that he's injured, and Griffith in one fell swoop, uh, he's very calculating, he's very precise, he's able to take out Guts. But for whatever reason, Guts has Griffith enamored with him, and Guts... Uh, Griffith wants Guts, so they take him. Guts has some nightmares as he's recovering of Gambino, crying for him to save him, and he says, you shoved the sword right through my throat. It hurt even to death. And, you know, you see a lot of this stuff in, in manga, in anime, in comics, in movies, where characters go through traumatic events, and they just, oh, they just brush them off. Like, whatever, right? But, as I said, the more you read into Berserk, the deeper it gets. And so... These instances of Guts with Gambino, and I believe he gets, uh, yeah, so he gets assaulted in this nightmare as well, uh, with the, I guess, foreshadowing of Casca and him falling in love in a weird way uh, there as well. But you'll notice that as a child, there's this primitive and very instinctive fear that Guts has as a kid of a large, overwhelming, all-encompassing being attacking him. And you think, oh, well, of course, you know, uh, any child would, especially having gone through that traumatic event. But, as we'll see later, I think in this, uh, in this deluxe edition volume, you'll see why that's a little bit more uh, important than simply having trauma for the sake of trauma, because I know uh, a lot of people have... A critique of Miura that he has a little bit too much sexual assault, sexual violence in his stories. And while I can see where that's coming from, I think if you immerse yourself in the world and in the story itself, and you kind of try to see it from the perspective of Miura, or rather the perspective of the characters or the storytelling, then you can be a little bit more... Uh, you may not like it, which, I mean, who would, right? Nobody likes that kind of topic. But... It, I, I do think that while it's not all necessary and it can be gratuitous at times uh, for the sake of the story and um, the characters, it's not as bad as many people want to make it out to be. Uh, and that's, of course, my opinion from reading this story uh, halfway through. Uh, but yeah, to me, it does add to the story more than it takes away. So as we go on, we get introduced to some uh, major characters in the Band of the Hawks. Uh, Pippin, he's a great guy. Everybody loves Pippin. Uh, and uh, Griffith takes him to the top of the hill, and he says, uh, he starts analyzing Guts. Kind of, He turns into Sigmund Freud. He says, you fight almost as though you're gambling your life every single time. So, of course, him and Guts fight. Casca is watching. Uh, Casca obviously likes Griffith. A lot of things are being established uh, in this early sign. Uh, the pages are very dense, packed. Uh, with information, uh, and they're fighting, right? They're pretty equally matched until they're not. Griffith, obviously calm. Guts is powering through the pain. He's learning at this young age how to enjoy it, as he does in later uh, editions of the series. And, you know, I mentioned last time, whenever Guts used his mouth to cut the slug count in half, that I that was the most metal thing... The amount of times that Guts uses his mouth to win fights is just... I love everything about it. So he catches Griffith's sword to throw him off balance by biting down on it, to throw Griffith off the hill and start 
physically attacking him until Griffith does some cheesy jujitsu and breaks his shoulder. And man, oh man, is it just really, really good stuff. Uh, Casca doesn't like Guts because he doesn't like Griffith. Uh, they're getting raided, and the story goes on until the next part of Golden Age. Uh, which is, this is whenever we get our first shot of Guts fighting with a mercenary band that he's going to be with for a pretty long time. Uh, rather, I misspoke. Uh, the mercenary band is raiding another group at the nightfall. Uh, Guts is charged with leading the raiders, and so they lead the raid. And we start to get a lot, a lot, a lot more shots of actual medieval, actual medieval combat and warfare illustrated to a great degree of precision and detail for more reasons than just having a lot of detail in the story. And so that brings it to an end as they begin to raid uh, this group. They're retreating from it. Guts is getting chased, and that establishes the next volume. But of course, you get this beautiful, beautiful shot of the nightfall, of the tents, of everything. So, uh, looking back on this, there wasn't actually as much uh, that I wanted to talk about as I can remember there being. So as the stories go on, there will be more to talk about. Uh, but I hope you guys enjoyed. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe. Uh, again, don't spoil it. I'm on, uh, I'm on volume six right now, so I'm pretty far into it. Um, but I'm pacing myself as I read it. Uh, I will have more of this, but, uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed. I'll see you.